All right, let's get started with our second talk and learn some more about other horticulture research going on at North Dakota State University. Harleen Hatterman Valenti is a professor, assistant head, and high value crop specialist in the plant sciences department. She joined NDSU in the year 2000, and she has a 85% research, 15% teaching responsibilities. She has sponsored three visiting scientists and trained two postdocs, three PhD students, 27 master's students, and she currently has three PhD and eight master's students in her program. Wow, that is impressive. That's like a, that's a factory. That's just like an amazing <laughs> wheelhouse of research you got going on there. To date, Harleen has published 58 peer-reviewed manuscripts. She's authored or co-authored three book chapters, published 185 scientific abstracts and proceedings, authored or co-authored 25 extension publications, and she's published 282 research reports. Since joining NDSU, she has given 274 extension presentations. And congratulations, after tonight, you can chalk up another one. You'll be oh, up to 275, there you go. So Harlene, welcome to the forums. Thank you, Tom. Welcome. And considering I don't have an extension appointment, but yeah. I, that's the part I really love to do. So, so um, tonight I'm going to talk about some of the high value research that we did this last year. And I, I was trying to find Buzz Lightyear to go and put him in here because I have that end beyond, but um, I decided just to get kind of spacey with my background. So hopefully, um, because hopefully I can tell you about some of the stuff that also is coming up in um, 2022 as well as 2023. So to begin with, okay, there we go. Um, so there's a lot of research that we are doing, but I wanted, I only have 20 minutes and I know Tom's very strict on that. So I've dropped, I pretty much focused on uh, five of them. And then that uh, the grape and Juneberry introductions, that'll be if we have enough time. Uh, so with that, you can see the first one I'm going to talk about is small scale vegetable planting technology. And this was to do, uh, done by a graduate student, uh, Sarah Bogenreef. She um, finished up uh, a couple weeks ago uh, and she's from the Minot area and really wanted to help more of your local food producers and uh, local uh, farm uh producers that were looking at vegetable production. So the first part of her research, and this had nothing to do with what she did for her master's degree, uh, this was something she wanted to do in addition. Um, so she wanted to see if um, these various hand planters, how efficient they were. And I have a picture of two of them. There's actually Four, she was using hand by hand completely. Uh, the next one uh, are two uh, vibrating ones that you can just dibble out the, the seed. And then the last one was more of a vacuum seeder, which has a vacuum suction and it uh, so that you can put them into a, a flat. You fill all the holes, you turn it over onto the flat and it plants them all at one time. So we wanted to see how that did for, we looked at three different sizes of seeds, lettuce, pepper, and melon. And then we looked at two different sizes of trays, 50 and 72 um, inch tra or cell trays. So the first thing she did was is she looked at how long it would take her to seed using uh, the ha hand versus the vibro which was uh, the one with the long trough on it. It just kind of vibrates and then those seeds kind of trickle down. Uh, the squeeze seedling seeding was the one with the or or the green little tray and it has that little hole. You kind of just squeeze them out into that area. And then the vacuum seeder is of course uh, something big and uh, uh, I explained before. So you can see here that when we looked at the lettuce, small seeds, uh, hand seeding was the best and vacuum seeding was the worst. And, and the main reason that the vacuum seeding was the worst was the fact that it, it it's not intuitive. I mean, you saw those other two, uh, let's see. I mean, these look pretty intuitive. You put your seeds 
uh, right in here and they and it vibrates and they you try to get them individually. Same here, you squeeze up there, you have that little hole and, and you try with your hand, you make the vibration. It doesn't have a vibrator and you try to single at those out or whatever number you want. Um, so um, what you can see with the vacuum seeder, it, it just, I mean, you got this big thing, you got to figure out where to put the hose on and all that stuff. So it took a bit to go and really understand the mechanics of it and how to go and, and um, get it to work properly because depending on the size hole where that air gets sucked up is how big the seed will be uh, that it will take. So there's a little bit of changing things around. Um, so we look at medium size, then we get into those vibrating ones. It's still with the with the real small seeds, you know, the vibrating or your hand vibrating. It's just impossible with the with lettuce seed to go and try to get that to be more individual and singlet. But once you get to the medium size, it, it's much easier. Um, here you see with the large seed, uh, the squeeze one. That's because the hole actually was inhibiting the uh, ability to kind of singlet those seeds. So here, when we got to the melons, you can see how everything else did pretty much the same, except for that squeeze seeder um, due to the hole restriction. So when we look at this, you know, it, when we're talking about time, if you have just one flat, hand seeding is probably, will be the quickest. Now, if we were to do 10 flats, and she did repeat so she could do statistics on this, but if you had a number of flats that you had to do, probably it would be switched around in which, especially for the small, you would, the vacuum seating is gonna become much more efficient. We didn't test that, so we can't say that, but you know, in, in this study, um, the hand seating was the quickest. When we look at, then she looked at how many days it took to germinate those seeds. Um, and, and so you see here again, we have those four seeders and that uh, the hand seeding was a day quicker to emerge in comparison to the vacuum seeding. When we got to medium size, uh, the hand seeding and the squeeze were, were the same and about uh, uh, two days ahead of the, the vibrating and the vacuum. Uh, and then when we got to the large seeds, again, the hand seeding, what, what turned out to be the best. Uh, um, and again, what Sarah contributed to this was the fact that when you do your hand seeding, you go and you push it into the depth that you want it uh, versus these others. Uh, if you if it needs to be covered by uh, media, then you have to leave so much out of that seating tray and then you cover it over. So you're going to get a lot of difference um, variations versus you can much easily, much more easily when you're pushing each one down, um, get that same kind of depth, thus uh, be able to go and influence the germination. She also looked at the, the field part. And with this, there was three uh, cedars. Uh, this uh, up in the top, uh, yellow one is the JP uh, or Jang JP1. Uh, the Earthway looks just like this, except for it doesn't have such a, a heavy wheel to it. And it, it's aluminum, it's really lightweight. Uh, it also had uh, various discs to change uh, for the different size seeds. This is the Glazer. And uh, that small little wheel is supposed to um, follow and kind of press the seed down. And you're supposed to be pulling this. We found this thing to be, um, it was the second most expensive and it was probably the biggest waste of any money possible. Um, not gonna, she also looked at some other stuff, but um, because of time, we're not gonna be able to do that. So here's, well, uh, we did this, we, repeated it twice. And so you can see, uh, let me go. So what we did was, what we have here is one, two, three different cedars. So this is radish seed. We did lettuce was the small, 
uh, radish was medium, and then beet was our large seed. Uh, and the fact that this is all emerged already probably indicates that it's uh, radish because they emerge so fast. You can see the kind of differences uh, we're seeing. The next one is probably the lettuce, and then right here at the end are the um, beets. And this is uh, our second wrap and our third wrap. So what did we find? Uh, on this, what we did was we counted the number of seedlings that emerged after a, a period of time. I, when I put this table together, for some reason I put lettuce in the middle, it should have been on this side. Uh, probably I did it on, um, well, so this tells you when we looked at them nine days after planting um, with the glazer having, okay, I'm gonna kind of set this up. When, they're, when their letters are different, that means statistically they are different. Um, the others, uh, there, we really didn't have a lot of statistical difference. Thus, we just had the plus and minus, which was uh, the standard error of uh, the differences uh, in those times and with the emergence. But here we are able to go and get some uh, real statistical differences uh, with the radish, the JP, uh, the Jane JP1 had the greatest emergence at nine days after planting, followed by Earthway, and then lastly, that glazer. When we go to that really small, the lettuce, again, here we have that the Earthway and the JP1 were the same. So even though we have those numbers difference, statistically, they are the same. However, as you can see on this comment down here, uh, with the JP1, the spacing for each seed drop was two and a half inches. So one third of the, our row didn't have plants in it and it still came up similar to the earthway. And then lastly, uh, with the beets, um, the earthway was the best by far. The JP1, uh, the little, uh, you, you, what you did is you changed this little kind of a rubber thing for the seed size. And um, this, it just wasn't quite big enough. And, and so sometimes two seeds got stuck and it wouldn't come through um, versus Earthway had, you know, there's, oh, I think eight different discs, maybe more for all the different size seeds. So it was way better than anything else. And, and the glazer didn't have anything that could even plant uh, a beet. Uh, and so nothing actually got planted, thus nothing even emerged. So if we were going to go and suggest anything, probably the, although I used all three of them, and I would say uh, that Jane JP1, that was so smooth. It, but it was because uh, we had a nice seed bed and it's a heavier instrument in comparison to the Earthway. But now it was also more expensive. So I would go with the Earthway anytime if you want to go and, and uh, not be bent over trying to go and plant that each of those seeds by hand. Okay, now we're gonna move on to our pepper trial. And with this, what we tried to do was uh, we wanted to see if there is a difference between nitrogen sources for bell pepper production. And we used urea as our standard. That's a soluble nitrogen for, um, source, but it also, if you get heavy rains, it can go and move below the root system and not be available and actually leach into the groundwater and those kind of concerns. Um, in contrast, the ESN, which stands for environmentally safe nitrogen and super U have different ways of holding on. They're like a slow release. So they hold on to that nitrogen and keep it more into that area where you applied it. So we use six um, cultivars and uh, we planted these, gosh, probably the third week in May last year. And if anyone can remember uh, that fourth week in May, we got this frost. Um, it was more than a frost, it was probably almost a, uh, well, it was a freeze. And 
knowing that these tomatoes would not um, take that, we went and we, we covered them up with a froth blanket. We made these little um, hoops that would keep them, uh, the, our frost blanket off of laying them down. And we were able to salvage everything. It was, um, and they would have been all toasted. Anything that was uh, warm season with that, I think it was May 26th frost would have been gone. Uh, so we we're really happy to, to know that we were able to go and uh, keep this alive. However, with all that cool weather that happened around that time, they just weren't doing anything. So we gave them some soluble fertilizer just to go and um, get them uh, going. And, uh, and what we see here as I'm going to set this up. So this is on our y-axis. This is called fruit number. And this is associated with the blue bars. And again, those letters, the capital letters, are associated with statistics there. The overall yield it's in grams, that is on the z-axis. And that's the orange bar. But really for you, you, um, uh, you could see that when we look at fruit number. I mean, it was an amazing year last year. Uh, plants for uh, King Arthur averaged 27 fruit, nice marketable bell um, peppers last year because we had so much heat. It was just amazing. And then with the fertilizer and with the, the drip irrigation, uh, it, was, it was really good. Uh, but you can see that that was not different for Olympus, Ninja, Intruder, or Cal Wonder. The only one where the number of fruit produced was better uh, was in comparison to Big Dipper, which produced the fewest amount of, of fruit per plant. But if you put that in perspective, at a graduate student looking at high tunnel versus field um, a few years back, uh, and in the high tunnel, we were at best, we were like right around 18 fruit. Uh, and here uh, on average here, you know, uh, we had five of them above uh, 20. So it was really pretty amazing uh, year for pepper production. And then when we look at, at yield, we can again see that at really um, the, our, our best three were King Arthur, Intruder and Olympus, and but uh, they were only better than Ninja and Cal Wonder and Big Dipper. Okay, now when and this is going to be hard to explain, but I'm going to, you know, if you were growing um, and selling it by weight each pepper, this is really important versus if you are going to sell them on a um, just a number uh, basis. Because what this talks about is the fruit weight, each individual fruit, how much it weighed for these cultivars, and we had an interaction. So the fertilizer didn't act the same. Um, and what this shows is that, you know, if you were looking at Cal Wonder, you would have been best and the heaviest fruit was when you used ESN. And the lightest fruit was when you used urea. But when something like Olympus, it really didn't matter much. Same with Big Dipper. Um, when it came to King Arthur, um, ESN was uh, the best uh, follow up, but that was very similar to Super U and, and then King Urea. But in here, Intruder, actually urea, which is the cheapest, and actually with the urea, that was supposed to be a split application, but because of that early nitrogen application, the plants look so green and lush, they didn't actually receive that last amount. So very much cheaper with the urea in comparison to the ESN or super U, which already on a, on a per amount of nitrogen basis, you're paying more to have, um, that nitrogen stick around. We're going to repeat this um, just to see what's what. And um, this time, no matter how good the plants look, 
we're going to give that second application of urea just to see if it changed things up. However, um, and, and we've already gotten the seed started for this, in 2023, oh, that's next. I see my next slide. Okay, our broccoli. Uh, I don't know if we're gonna go and look at anything further after this with, with pepper, unless we have some real differences there. So our next one is peppers. And, you know, peppers, boy, they've come out with a whole bunch of new all purple, you know, and all these health attributes. And, and so we said, well, you know, the last time we did this was in 2002. And I don't even recognize any of these cultivars anymore. So we wanted to see just how the peppers would do. We have nine of these cultivars. Some of them are uh, sprouting. Some of them, you know, are just green, but they have um, additional health attributes to them as, as maybe a marketing tool. But we wanted to see, is that really true? Uh, so first of all, we said, well, um, to go and test for all these compounds, we can't have this many. So we wanted to do a preliminary test to see how they did. And of course, um, last year, we thought it was gonna be the best year ever. And uh, with coal crops, of course, you can see here, the peppers were planted behind me there. Um, and so we planted our coal crops first. There was, you know, we weren't concerned about the frost and, and we didn't have to. And that just above shows those 2002. Here's a picture of uh, the harvest, uh, one of the uh, three harvests that we had. And so you can see we had some purple ones. We had some really large uh, heads and we had some more of the sprouting ones that had the smaller heads, but you get more, you keep on picking on those. And when we looked at, um, the, the yield, um, you can see we had some really bad ones. So we had three different harvests for our plants and we had um, these three that basically did not produce a head. Now remember last year was really warm and cold crops, broccoli and cauliflower, if, if when that head formation, if we get above 85 degrees, you'll end up with a blind head. We had some huge plants, but they never produced a, a head on them. So you can see our, our top five, um, and you know, Green Magic isn't one of those that um, is, is uh, purple by any means, but you these um, um, burgundy for sure is, red fire is, I'm pretty sure uh, Chakaranda is, Santa Fe, I think it's green. But anyway, so what we're gonna do is we're repeating this. Uh, again, we have these seeds already started and um, going to see, hopefully we have a different year uh, in which we'll see how they really produce. I mean, you can see even with um, some of these other ones that, uh, you know, they just, Purple peacock wasn't it? You know that wasn't the greatest when when we're talking. You know, um, one out of three plants actually producing a head uh, in our experimental units. What we're also going to do, and then I got a little ahead of myself last time, is that we have we have a grant. So starting in 2023, we're going to actually look at these health attributes that they have and just see under North, Con North Dakota conditions, what kind of differences we actually have in those health attributes, those anthocyanins uh, and phenolics that are common with that purple color, um, just where those levels are. So really excited for that research, let alone what we're gonna do this year. Okay, so our other one was with cauliflower and you can see there was even more available for cauliflower and this is the first time we even did anything with cauliflower. Um, so in cauliflower, we have everything from like the cheddar, which is, has vitamin C, more vitamin C to a bunch of those purple ones. And, and then of course, like snow crown, we, we wanted some that were just our traditional for comparison as well. And uh, here's just a picture of some of those, uh, deep purple, really, really purple. Um, and when we looked at the yield, of course, now we did have uh, more of these, 
So you can see um, basically these were our five best and these were the, our four worst. They're all right down here after a third harvest, really having hardly anything. Um, again, uh, the main problem and it, from what we saw, uh, cauliflower was even more susceptible to the blind head than, than broccoli. Uh, so we're hoping to see some really, um, hopefully uh, for like uh, the Ponto Verde, that it again is really good, but that everything else moves up, which will make our um, exclusion of what to keep for year 2023 more difficult, but that'll be a, a good thing. And so again, in 2023, we'll be looking at the health attributes of uh, cauliflower as well. So the last thing we're gonna talk about is uh, really the strawberries. And this, uh, Mika has done this one where we're looking at three different environments. These are day neutral strawberries. So unlike June bearing strawberries, they produce throughout the year, uh, you go and do a lot of runner removal so that they don't divert their energies into making little babies. Um, and the only problem is if your temperatures get above 85, um, 90, it really suppresses any kind of uh, flower and fruit production. And of course, last year was extremely hot. One other thing we did wrong last year was well, we, wanted, we thought it'd be best to compare the three different environments, an open field using these low tunnels or the high tunnel to plant them all at the same time. Well, uh, doing that, we're not taking advantage of that season extension early in the season with the high tunnel um, and somewhat with these low tunnels, they're just little plastic. They only go up about um, two foot, uh, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and uh, allow it to breathe, but you know, clear plastic really does a wonderful job of, of getting in the sun um, and, and trapping that to heat. Uh, so you can see the six cultivars that we looked at. And what we, what Mika found was that there was no difference between environments because we planted them all on the same day. Thus, we weren't really able to take advantage of the differences that those environments had. So this year we're gonna do that. But with that, um, here on the total yield, you can see that Albion was um, the highest and, and San Andres was the lowest. That was on total yield for all the strawberries that, that were there. Then when um, Mika adjusted that for missing plants, um, because some of them, when we transplant it, um, didn't go and survive. Uh, now we see that um, Portola did much better, um, well, slightly better, I wouldn't say much better, but did the, was the highest yielding for total yields. And then came Albion, EV2, and Fort Laramie. Uh, Seascape and San Andres were, were the worst. When, oops. When uh, Mika looked then at the total soluble solids, what he did with that was he picked out three different Julian days. So 234 days from January 1st, 264 days and 294 days. And he looked at the bricks or soluble solids. And uh, what we can see here is that um, at 264, well, that was probably right in the middle of the summer type thing. Uh, I should have looked up the exact dates. We, um, some of these like EV2 and Fort Laramie uh, tended to be sweeter. Um, earlier in the season when we don't have as much uh, sun for ripening and, and increasing, you know, the sugars is all some, uh, with, with heat and sunlight. Um, so a little bit lower than when we went to 294 days, we're getting more into fall, it, get, it drops down again um, for some of these. Some of these other ones, you know, like Seascape, uh, basically it, it, it maintained throughout the seasons once we got to a little bit later in the season. So 
Let me see. Do I have time? Do I have time? No, I don't. Okay. So this other stuff is on um, available for you to see. Uh, I think Tom made the notes that way because uh, you can see we did a lot of uh, um, research in other things. And uh, with that, I'll just say thank you. And and this is, you know, I'm always looking for ideas of how I can help you. So um, if you want certain kind of research conducted, you know, send me an email or, or if you have certain horticultural questions that you need, you know, a, a non-bias, I'll set it up into a, so that we aren't being biased in our judgment. It isn't, it's not going to be just a demonstration. We're actually going to set it up so that um, we take into um, consideration location in, in uh, planting row, as well as how soil can change. But would love to hear anything more as far as um, things that you guys are looking to have answered in the future. So with that, Tom. Hey, thanks, Harleen. And we do invite the questions from the audience. One question we had, Harleen, was it had to do with um, this person raised peppers mm -hmm. and their peppers had thin walls on the fruits. Could that have been related to the drought or what do you think? Um, it somewhat, well, yes, somewhat, I think it's all physiological. Um, and again, you, the, the partly genetics, but um, nutrition can also influence that as we saw with the nitrogen um, on that. So, yeah. And this person also mentions that some, some of the peppers, like you mentioned genetics, this person had some Hungarian cheese peppers and jalapenos that had fantastic cell walls, but some of the yeah. bells had a problem. Yeah, and and those you know those hot peppers really like heat even better than oh, bell bell yeah. peppers. So That's they, sure. you know, I had some yeah chilies and gosh, those just went crazy. So why did you test Cal Wonder? That's a terrible variety. It has no disease resistance, Harley. What are you doing there? Come on. Yeah, well. That's um, a cheap one that you buy at the garden center because the yeah, company um, garden so, center wants to buy the cheapest seed. So don't buy a Cal Wonder. Call. Yeah, but, you know, it's available all over. So yeah, yeah. even at Johnny's. So we said, okay, we're going to, you know, use really? it more as the standard um, just because, yeah. It it's been out there forever. Yep. It's yep. There you go. I was just my personal comment oh, there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and you're right. Um, but, I, uh, I never buy that at a garden center. That's just that was yeah, that's yeah. the past. I mean, it's, anyhow, how about what do you think the difference? Like you did uh, nitrogen trials. Would Miracle Grow have similar effects? Okay. Uh, and it, it would have had similar, well. It probably would have similar effects in that, you know, we wanted to get away from uh, a grower gets busy in the summer. So instead of the spoon feeding with miracle Grow, um, in which you'd have to go and have an injector for the drip tape and all that kind of stuff, mm. we wanted to see a one and done or, you know, come with a split application, but not that you had to go and and figure out, okay, you know, how much to mix up and then, and, and um, do a hose on or any kind of, and when you get bigger like that, then you have to start worrying about safety and back siphoning and, and all that. So we, we looked at using these solids granulars as a way to avoid some problems with um, uh, more of the spoon feeding with miracle grow or something like that. Well, I think next year your topic, your your two, your three hundredth extension publication uh, presentation by then should be how to grow peppers because anybody can get twenty five fruits on a plant. That's that's pretty incredible. I gotta say, uh, thirty six was the highest. Thirty six. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And you don't did you stake those plants? Uh no. No, they just. Wow, that's quite a fruit load there. But uh, we were in the southern part of Absaraca, so it's surrounding. You can kind of see we got 
trees on the west, mm-hmm. trees on the south, and and the apple trees all on the north. So it's really in a nice kind of protected area where it doesn't get a lot of wind. If uh, if we were in more of an open field condition, yeah, we would have done a weave on them to go and, and make sure that um, they didn't break over. You know, you mentioned about some of your, uh, oh, I just got a question. Here. Do you top your peppers to get them bushier? Do you pinch them? No, we didn't. Oh. How about you mentioned you had some cauliflower plants that went blind? What does that mean? Or what causes blindness? Um, good question, Tom. So blind head is when when that cauliflower is starting to form the head, you get um, too high a temperatures and they are sensitive to actually not forming a head then because the temperatures are too high. Um, God, I had some cauliflowers. I, I swear they were probably almost three and a half foot tall, leaves uh, this wide, and uh, not a head to be found. <laughs> so frustrating. That's a hard. That's a hard crop to grow. Yeah, I think so. With our stressful conditions we have here, I, that's a hard one. Okay, I think we're just going to let it go at that. Thank you, okay. Arlene, for sharing your results and. We look forward to more results in the future. Appreciate it. Thank you.